Ready? All right, thank you for your patience, everyone. A little bit of uh, technology challenge, as often happens. <laughs> um, and I, I, I know we are w running a little bit behind, but I think we may catch up. Um, so, panel number three, which is, the title is, Keeping It All Together, Information Systems and Content Management. Uh, the moderator for that is Alyssa Cherry. And Alyssa is the research manager at the Audrey and Hawthorne Library and Archives at the Museum of Anthropology, often referred to as MOA here today at UBC. Alyssa is a member of the Indigitization Steering Committee, so she and I have a lot of face time, <laughs> have had a lot of face time and with the other steering committee members for the planning of this event. And she herself completed an indigitization grant uh, a few years ago and, and worked at the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. So she's well versed in um, the kinds of projects that you have been, inverse, have been in immersed in and, and for those who are new who will be undertaking. So I'll turn it over to Alyssa and you just use the mic there and yeah. this one goes back here. All right, thank you, Gordon. I'm going to be talking about software today just briefly. I'll let you guys know that we did invite a few other people. We were hoping to have somebody on here talking about using a DB Textworks database. We were hoping to have somebody talking about Past Perfect. We'd invited the developers of the Reciprocal Research Network. But due to other meetings going on this weekend, none of those people could come. So I'm going to talk just very briefly about my experience with a few systems, including DB Textworks, and actually Greenstone as well. But uh, yes, as Gordon mentioned, I did do an a indigenization grant project to digitize a bunch of our Chiefs Council meeting minutes when I worked for the Union of BC Indian Chiefs a few years ago. So for that particular project, um, because the Chiefs Council meeting minute meetings are closed, those weren't anything we could make available online. So what we did for those was basically just use spreadsheets in a DB Textworks database to make them accessible. But during my time at the UBCIC, we also built a lot of other digital collections. Um, my predecessor there, Kim Lawson, she had built uh, Our Homes Are Bleeding, a database with uh, the McKenna McBride testimonies. So we had Greenstone already loaded on a server, so I continued to use that to build a bunch of other digital collections in multiple formats. And Greenstone is also the software that Candace was talking about in the Ulukau um, database, the electronic library, as well as the Papakilo database database, which is sort of a metadatabase of databases of Hawaiian um, materials. And one thing that I thought was really amazing that those guys did over there with that software was they incorporated a function where people, they actually got the community to transcribe some of those Hawaiian language newsplay papers. And that was always kind of a dream of mine that I had when I was at the UBCIC to get, uh, to get the community to start transcribing things like the Joint Indian Reserve Commission's Minutes of Decision and Correspondence because even though those are in English, you know, they're handwritten, so you can't just scan them and pump them through OCR software to get them machine searchable. They actually have to be transcribed kind of word for word. So I know those guys in, in Green Source, Greenstone is open source, so I know those guys in Hawaii would be willing to share their code. And kind of the moral of my story with software is there's nothing out there that's going to do everything that you want it to do. Anybody that's worked with me knows that I do a lot of whining and complaining about software and muttering, trying to get it to do what I want it to do, and it never seems to really happen. And you know, we've been looking long and hard for a system that will kind of integrate library materials with archive materials, with museum materials, and that's one thing that our first speaker, Elizabeth Schaefer, is going to talk about. She's going to talk about her experience trying to customize a system and and we'll move on from there. Elizabeth is the Director of Collections at the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center. She's also a doctoral candidate at the School of Library, Archival, and Information Studies, the iSchool here at UBC. Her dissertation research focuses on policy, practice, and record-keeping implications of emergent technology use in the Canadian government. Her research interests include critical inquiry into how information policy and practices emerge and evolve in contemporary digital spaces, with particular attention to social justice issues and collections that document traumatic human events. So I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you. 
Thanks so much for that. Um, and thank you to, <coughs> is that loud enough? I don't speak for that, sorry. <coughs> to uh, Sarah and the conference organizers for inviting me to speak here today. I'm hoping that some of the lessons we've learned in our project, some of the mistakes we've made and, and things we've done will be useful to your projects moving forward potentially. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people and um, thank them for their gracious hospitality. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, is that making a noise? I'm going to talk about um, collective access, which is um, sure. okay. our implementation of collective access. So it's a, a software program, a collection management system that we've spent the last few years um, kind of developing and, and forming into something we're hoping will um, work for our library, museum, archive, and our survive, Holocaust survivor testimony collection. Um, I, because we're kind of in the last few months of getting it onto our servers and getting it ready, I don't have it to live to show you where a lot of screenshots or anything. I did get um, our team to put a little bit into the system, so I have something to show you. But um, I think talking about it will, will be great, and um, I'm happy to share it once it's out and live. <laughs> and so, Wow, that size. I was nervous before, but wow. I'm <laughs> <laughs> kidding, sorry. Okay, so here we go. So um, I work at the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center, as um, Alyssa said. It's a teaching museum. We're devoted to um, anti-racism education, so anti um, basically promoting human rights, social justice, and genocide awareness through education and remembrance of the Holocaust. Um, we've, um, it started in 1983 in Vancouver by Holocaust survivors. Our center was built in 1994. We have a very large education mandate. So we engage over 25 students and teachers annually. We have a symposium um, at UBC annually as well as around the Lower Mainland. We produce thematic exhibits, school programs, teaching materials, and we present a number of public and cultural events and commemorative events. Um, we also have a museum collection, an archives, a survivor, Holocaust survivor testimony collection, and a library collection. Um, our Holocaust um, survivor testimony collection, which I think is maybe most relevant to, I'll focus a fair bit on today, is um, began in 1979 and goes through to the present. We continue to collect Holocaust survivor testimonies. We've been fortunate to um, have some funding over the last few years to digitize our collection, so all of our audio or video, and as well as our museum and archives collection. So we're in the middle of a three to four year project to do that. Um, however, it wasn't um, robustly cataloged. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as well. And um, we lacked a robust collection management system. We had a proprietary dated um, database that was just not effectual in, in us getting access to anything. So when we sat down, we realized, how do we do this? And so we naively went searching for a system that would give us library, archive, museum, and audiovisual kind of asset management um, in one space, particularly since we were going to be digitizing and utilizing this in our education mandate. And we kind of came up against either it was really, really, really expensive and unsustainable. Um, I should mention we're a nonprofit and grant funded, and so sometimes we're, that's great, other times there's no grant, so as I think many organizations here, um, it's ebb and flow. So sustainability is huge for us. When we have grant funding, we try to build the capacity, and we also try to leverage that so they can reach out to the communities that have helped us in the past and, and build cultural heritage, sustainability, and capacity within a larger construct. So we went looking and kind of found nothing, really. Um, either, like I said, there were a couple of systems that said they could do all of that, but were very expensive. They were proprietary and out of our means. So we looked, went down the open source route, we don't have um, reliable tech support. Again, as an, um, a nonprofit, we kind of have intermittent <laughs> and as needed tech support. So initially, we were quite nervous about going down the open source route, but we've um, fully embraced it. I'll, I'll talk about that, and are, are pretty excited about the, the outcome of that. Um, and the nice thing is, is that all of the investment that we're able to put into developing and building our system, we're then able to then share, and other people can pick it up and, and use it um, in any way they like, so it's pretty great. So I'm going to talk first about collaboration. So 
I don't know if, if you're an archivist, a librarian, or a curator, you might get this. <laughs> but the, uh, the irony here is that um, we couldn't even decide on what word, whether it was a bar or a room, or what did they walk into? <laughs> so that shows you not only do we not have the same protocols for managing information, we can't even decide what room we're supposed to be in. So I was preparing for this talk, I was chatting with our museum curator and saying, you know, how do I summarize some of the complexities that we, we encountered? And there was often, as this we'll see, a lot of humor in the room because we were trained in, in institutions like this to hold on to these paradigms of archival practice or museum practice or library practice or digitization protocols that give us um, these instructions and tell us how information should be managed and then we kind of go into these spaces and, and, and do that and enact those, those protocols. But in our space, we were small, and so we decided to kind of try to break down some of those barriers because we wanted to kind of say, well, what if you don't know what you're looking for? And we wanted to take the best of, of all of those, those disciplines and put them forward. So libraries are great at access, and archives, quite frankly, are kind of rubbish at it. And, but they're really, really good at aggregations and context. And museums are great at that really in-depth, you know, um, provenantial information about objects, and digitization opens up a ton of possibilities, but also a lot of problems that we've heard a lot about over the last few days around access protocols, permissions, etc. So we kind of threw all of these things into the room with all of these different professionals, and um, it wasn't always fun, <laughs> or, or, or we didn't always get along, but we always really, I think, went into it with the spirit of really wanting to break down some of these barriers and build up something potentially better, or moving us in a direction of collaboration sustainability. So um, we worked to build this system, I should say, with developers un under our grant, um, and so we built it really in an innovative and experimental way in the hopes of doing this. And we always put our collections and our community at the core of it. Because our connection is so specific to the Holocaust, so it, it includes um, pre-war life in mostly in Europe, it includes Holocaust era documentation, um, artifacts, and stories, and then post-war settlement in Canada, primarily British Columbia, as well as a robust testimony collection. So we work towards eliminating these silos, towards educating each other about our discipline specific strengths and weaknesses, and worked at building these cross-discipline interrelationships. And so for the collections, we decided to go with open source, as I mentioned, and we took this cross-collection approach. We were going to build a system that everything lived in. As we uncovered what collective access could do for us, there, there was a lot of wins for sure, and it opened up, I think we gave our developers um, quite a challenge, we have over seven metadata schematas in there. So we kind of really cherry picked um, and everybody in the system kind of shares each other. So it's one large, basically, profile. And we pick our favorite things from, um, from what, what we have. So we assemble the team, essentially, and I'll, I'll talk about them a little bit throughout. We have a librarian, a metadata librarian, archivists, digitization experts, museum experts on our team, a lot of students that are um, brilliant and gung-ho and keen, and we took this cross-collection approach. So we settled on actually putting all four collections in. At one point, we weren't sure we'd be able to pull it off, and we a few weeks to launch, so hopefully we will. Um, and we put access as a priority. So, but access, unlike like we've been hearing a lot um, today, access can be difficult when you have um, sensitive materials. And so, our mandate is education. We're, uh, we use our education commemoration. Um, we use our testimonies. We haven't been able to use them because they've been sitting on umatic tapes and other media on shelves for a very long time. So by digitizing those, we needed to find a way to make them accessible. But as we looked through all of the institutional documentation, we had just this plethora of permissions and they all had different, you know, they were from different decades and different projects. And so we had to do a lot of unpacking there. And what we realized was access wasn't very straightforward. So we had to build a system that allowed for applications of metadata and allowed for us to kind of push certain things to the front, pull certain things back, again, similar to what we've been talking about all day, but also to kind of ease out. So as we kind of figured out these permissions, we could make these things more and more accessible and usable, and also friendly to students and researchers who wanted to work in the system. We had a lot of legacy data and a lot of systems that were proprietary and old, so we had to 
wrangle the data out of these. And um, as our survivor community ages, we anticipate quite a large growth in the next few years of testimonies as well as artifacts as well as documents coming into our collection. So we really want to be ready to make these things available as they come because while we've been doing this for a long time, they've kind of been tucked away. So digitization allows us to do this and the system that supports it. We did a lot of customization to the system, so the nice thing about open source is you can do that. So we've had plugins where we can do timelines, we can do story maps, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit of that. Um, it allowed us to really, really customize our metadata. So we can have transcriptions and translations and transliterations that we can attach to testimonies. We can have you know, all kinds of protocols. But as we work through the system, we realized it's a relational database. So as soon as you put the data in there, it works really, really hard and well to find it. And so even though you've said, you know, it's an anonymous donation, you still have that person's information in there. So we really had to, as we move forward, forward through the system, um, there were lots of places where the data that was supposed to be suppressed would pop up unexpectedly. So that was a, a tougher challenge because we had a library which was constantly pushing all of its information out and the other collections, which we consider the primary source collections, which were far more mediated and complex in their requirements. Um, and then sustainability. So sustainability at many levels, and for us as a small organization who happens to be fortunate to have a, an, a healthy grant window right now, has also experienced times when we haven't had many. So reaching out to communities to build capacity, to build um, relationships and to make our system sustainable into the future so that we can again build a system that hopefully is um, usable for us and for others and that's a, a lot of the reason why we did um, an open source system as well. So we can't I guess make a boutique system but in an open source way uh, we benefited from a lot of um, the things that other collections had done in collective access. We're able to put it into our collection and then we built a number of things that I think protocols, access protocols, permissions that potentially would be useful moving forward. One other thing we did do is, um, at parallel to this, we're also uh, developing a digital preservation strategy for our collection. And as everybody here knows, working with digitization, as soon as you start to digitize, you immediately think about digital preservation. So we're a small institution, so we don't, we can't preserve in the cloud because, again, that's not sustainable for us. So we chose a tape, kind of offline version of uh, LTO version of. Um, digital preservation, but we actually created a, a module in here to manage the preservation metadata. So as we enter everything into the system for the first time, we can immediately put that digital preservation into the system alongside of the other metadata and then just export it out with our, our preservation files. So while, it, I mean, it's not... Um, brilliant, but I mean for us it was really, really exciting and it's also something we can pay back into the system. So now the system that was not a digital preservation system, and it technically is still not, has the capacity for smaller institutions who really, really need digital preservation to now attach that to their systems moving forward. So that's kind of what we mean by capacity building, by leveraging, um, and by, you know, being part of a cultural heritage community, pay paying it forward, I guess. So talking a little bit about community. So um, institutional knowledge, like many institu uh, comp uh, in communities here, really lies in individuals for us. So how do, we, how do we build a system that allows us to transfer that into the system and, and, and support it and have it for those people that are coming after us? We inherited a lot of legacy systems, as I said, that unfortunately didn't give us that information we needed when we needed it. Um, as I mentioned, we have an aging survivor community, those relationships that are built. And it's as you hear survivors, they come into our center on a daily basis, they talk about that legacy moving forward and what's going to happen to it. So for them to see their stories digitized, for them to see them being used in the context of community to educate students is very important. Um, so hence the preservation piece was really important for us. And for, for a small organization, these projects have essentially tripled our staff for two years. So there's a lot of organizational change going on, um, which you know for, is positive for the most part, but it does shift kind of priorities and it shifts things, um, and those kinds of things. So that's really impacted as well how we've built the system and how we've been able to progress. So institutional infrastructures, norms, cultures, they can be slow to shift um, and they can, you know, kind of wreak havoc on deadlines <laughs> for sure, as well as space and staffing, etc. So that, those were some lessons we learned. 
So this map here, um, so I was talking about how we were able to look at our collection and ground our decisions for what we did in our collection. This is Dr. Robert Krell. He's a um, professor emeritus from UBC in psychiatry. He's a child survivor of the Holocaust. He started this video testimony project in 79. Um, this is him actually giving an address at the UN last year on, on um, Holocaust Remembrance Day. And so in our system, Dr. Robert Crowell has a phenomenal amount of identities or entity relationships with things. So each of those um, boxes represents a record. So it's a library record, an archival record, a testimony record, an exhibition, things have been featured in, a book, etc., or another entity. Um, and then the um, links are basically those relationships. So the text that links the boxes defines what the relationships are. And believe it or not, this is only probably half of his relationships. His parents are in our system as Holocaust survivors. He also has a family who rescued him. So as a righteous among the nation, they're in our system. He's an author. He's the creator of a project. He's an interviewer. He's an interviewee. He, he holds so many roles. And so all of those relationships were really hard to define in the system. But through working it through, we're able to then um, build a system that affords for those relationships. So when you look at his collection and you, you kind of put in his name, you get all of the material, not just the library, not just the archive, the testimony. You get all of that information that's available that people are allowed to access comes up in, in a relationship kind of form. And I, again, I apologize. I just kind of drafted these up because our system isn't, I can't show you what it looks like, but it's, you know, looks like this. And so by putting four systems together, because they're so different, we had to do some, some innovative things. So we used resource type. So if you look at resource type, like a book or a museum object or a moving image, like a testimony, you can search all four collections at once, which for us was a coup. And you get a pretty robust return, but then there's secondary and tertiary sources, so you can limit those by subject, by dates, by geography. And then for the library, so for the museum, testimony, and, sorry, archive museum, <laughs> sorry, uh, everything with the library, museum, testimony, and um, archives collection, we did genres. And so primary sources, um, again, we're an education institution, so the learning outcomes for um, BC students, the curriculum, primary sources are very important. And so we build a lot of curriculum um, into our programming. So this allows you now to search the collections by are very specific. Like we have very, as you can see, things that are very, very specific are collections. So we're really able to hone it right in and get a really robust and rewarding research for, for those um, users of our system. And again, you can put in secondary and tertiary resources after this. This is a back-end view of a survivor testimony record. And what this kind of demonstrates, um, just as an example, is how you can see on the left-hand side here. So these are all some of the things we're able to build in, like the digital preservation, the access points, the things like that. But also, this is Alex Buckman, a child survivor himself. And this is his journey from um, basically the journey that he talks about in his story. But then we can manifest this more. And uh, some of the things about geography in this system as well is we can customize it. So the, the nice thing about this system, and so it's applicable to us, but I think it's broadly applicable beyond us, is um, in systems like this, you also have to have authority file. So we were able to generate a local thesaurus that was very specific to the kinds of material we have, which is obviously very Holocaust focused. But also for places, we have these, uh, the, what they call the thesaurus of geographic names it tests against, but we also have um, what we put in as a place table of all the camps, so the, the, the ghettos, the camps, the elimination camps, the DP camp, the displaced person camps, etc. So it really, really made it specific to that. And students go in, use material, tag it, and there's a lot of interactive features such as light box and timelines, and they can use this material then across collections. So they can pull in a library book maybe they've read for a class. They can pull in a portion of Alex's testimony because they can view it online and actually edit it in the system. They can combine that with a, you know an artifact in our collection that's related to Alex's recipe book that he in his talk to students, and they can make a presentation that then they can put out into a PowerPoint and present in their class. So it really makes our collection useful to students, to us, to our community. And I think I'm probably running on time here, so um, yeah.
Yeah, I think that's probably a little bit about what we did and how we kind of hopefully collapsed some of those barriers. So I think it's really important to acknowledge the amazing team and advisors, many of which are in this room, that have helped us on the project um, and a, a, some amazing, amazing students. So thank you so much for your time and attention today. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Our next panelist is Amber Riddington. Amber is completing her PhD in folklore at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Her doctoral research examines oral and technological curation practices within the Denisa Dreamers song tradition, as you might remember from panel two. As a practicing folklorist and heritage consultant since 2001, Amber has worked collaboratively with a number of First Nations in British Columbia and Alaska on heritage projects ranging from virtual repatriation and multimedia exhibition to traditional land use studies. Her award-winning professional and academic work explores critical issues surrounding cultural, heritage, cultural property, and cultural sustainability. And I will get your, uh, we gotta change a little something okay. here. Well, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Alyssa. <laughs> it's good to be here on unceded Musqueam territory on Coast Salish lands. And it's good to be here at UBC also learning from everyone here uh, from your experience with heritage technologies. And thanks also to the organizers of the panel for inviting me here today. So today I want to talk about um, my ongoing work with the McLeod Lake Seconi Band. They're Athabascan people in Treaty 8 territory in northeastern British Columbia, interior uh, of B British Columbia, uh, to develop a community archive to house their digital heritage collections and to link these to a, uh, a development referral, a land governance tracking system, so that the band can better uphold their Aboriginal and treaty rights. And I'll share my experience with testing out or demoing a number of the rapidly evolving digital heritage curation tools and technologies that are out there. And um, I, I will be, draw as you know, I've, uh, my work with, with uh, archive management and uh, digital preservation and um, community engagement dates back to um, 2003. So um, a lot of technological changes have happened over that time and um, the process of working with the communities has been almost as important, probably more important than the actual product sometimes, especially for the community articulating those um, rights and interests in types of cultural property, whether it's group heritage or individual heritage or kin-based heritage. Um, so this project began in 2012 as part of a traditional land use study that I did with McLeod Lake to assess potential impacts on heritage, uh, intangible and material heritage resources from the construction of the Site C Dam. And uh, I want to thank my collaborators on all this work, uh, Deborah Prince and Mark Diffin, uh, from, they're the land referral managers at McLeod Lake. Um, Deborah Prince started the work and Mark Diffin is continuing it. Um, Darius Gillis, who is uh, their GIS technician, the McLeod Lake community. Um, Jody Perkins, who is uh, um, an adjunct with SLACE and a MLS consultant. And Michael Ashley also, who helped us with um, our, our pilot project with the Mukatu CMS. So uh, as part of the TLU study that I did uh, for the Site C Dam, um, we designed into the budget, we built digital archiving for existing archival sources and previous TLU studies and the newly video recorded oral history interviews. We built all this into the study. Um, budget. Um, 
as uh, McLeod Lake, like most other First Nations in Canada, don't have a library or archiving system in place. So this was one opportunity to get funding to uh, start an archive. So as a pilot project, we decided to try out the Mukatu content management system, um, which was then at version 1.5 being developed by anthropologist Kim Kristen White Whitley. And we were excited about its design, incorporating features to assign cultural protocols to heritage materials and to add traditional knowledge, uh, traditional customs for access, care, transmission, that type of thing. Uh, so we began the second e-community archive using the Mukutu platform as part of the TLUS. And uh, we started entering data that we had collected from previous TLU studies as well as from our own, and uh, began to share materials with the community members to get their feedback of, what, what, of the system. They loved having their heritage so easily accessible and began to think of using the archive to document much more, like traditional language, their genealogies, and to map traditional activities like hunting, fishing, camping, praying on the land. Um, this is uh, an example um, of uh, an already public record, so I'm able to show it to you, um, from the BC archives that um, we incorporated into the site. Um, so as we began to enter data, we found that some features of the CMS worked well for us, while others didn't. I, as, as a, sort of the archivist and liking to have context with digital material, <laughs> um, liked the standard Dublin Core metadata that they incorporated um, that gives each piece uh, uh, um, of material a context. And the community members really loved the traditional knowledge category where they could add an information to the standard records. But we began, however, as we began to define communities, um, different access groups to the cult and um, their cultural protocols, we realized that the cultural protocols didn't work well for second E peoples who are non stratified, bilateral hunting people. Um, they privilege individual knowledge and individual relationships with heritage materials over any kin based or gender based rights to access to materials. Uh, or to use materials. Um, so uh, you'll see here it became, as we started to define communities or user groups, the only way to do it was to add every individual as a user group. And we stopped at about 50 <laughs> user group individuals because it, we realized it wasn't, that was sort of a, a it just wasn't going to work for us because. Um, there's no point in tagging everything if you, the proto, if the protocol basically is you have to deal with everything on an individual basis anyways. There's, there's no shortcut to um, protocols, basically. Um, but we did, it, working with the system really helped us think about um, uh, some of the some of the types they might like to restrict access. So we came up. You probably can't see this here, but we came up with uh, different um, categories of cultural heritage, open community access, cultural heritage restricted access to protect an individual's personal medicine power, cultural heritage restricted access to protect a dreamer's power, cultural heritage restricted access uh, because of confirmed legal privilege cultural heritage restricted access um, because of possible legal privilege, um, and cultural heritage restricted access needs further consultation. Um, so those were sort of some of the, the ways that the community that there was wanted to um, sort through the material. Um, uh, so um, also we realized that at the time the system was a little more beta than we had expected it to be. Um, video, video was only accessible through third parties like YouTube or Vimeo. Um, it had limited geospatial mapping features, which was something that the community really wanted to be able to have um, at that time. Um, uh, and um, there was, yeah, those were the sort of the main issues. 
Oops. So um, using the MUKADU CMS made me realize that it, like the Reciprocal Research Network, um, uh, the, or the RRN, which Dave described earlier, <laughs> was developed in collaboration with First Nations as a virtual repatriation tool to provide Indigenous First Nations groups with um, uh, access to their heritage materials that are housed by and owned by outside institutions such as museums and archives. Um, and what we actually, so here's, uh, just a, I, I, will, I won't dwell on these, these uh, details, <laughs> those details. Um, so we began to look for uh, open source land referral tracking systems that have emerged to help deal with uh, government mandated heritage consultation through environmental impact assessments mostly. Um, and um, I found that they seem to serve the needs of developers to provide an automated workflow for timely review of development plans. Um, and they also help the First Nation with that workflow. Um, but many are built uh, have built in direct to digital mapping capabilities also, um, streamlining consultation processes um, for mapping. Um, and, but most of them had limited archival setups. So um, a lot of them really didn't have standardized metadata um, when we first began reviewing them. But that seemed to change. We started this in 2020. Well, by the time we were looking at this, where it was probably 2014. Um, but just in the last two years, oh, I'm down to five minutes, it's really changed. Um, so I'm going to just show you uh, the top group. Um, that was uh, Truvian Labs. Um, they have no archiving tool, but excellent geospatial integration. Stolo Connect, which Dave Sheppey talked about. It had, all of these have excellent geospatial integration. Um, and. Um, Trailmark systems, um, again, this is uh, 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 developed as both a, a repository and, um, uh, and a, a tracking system. Well, they're starting to develop it into a tracking system. Um, then uh, the Community Knowledge Keeper is another one. Uh, Lewis Toolkit, which is based on biography mapping um, sort of standards and methodologies um, from Terry Tobias, and Signals for First Nations Governance. Was, we um, tried out all of those systems. Um, I'm going to just go back here, and the ones on the top are all um, uh, custom built, custom designed systems, and the ones on the bottom here are uh, mostly Drupal-based, um, sort of um, uh, customizing already boxed CMSs. Um, and um, because of some of our experiences with Mukatu, we started realizing we thought we wanted maybe a more custom-designed ones, design system. Uh, let me just go here. And... So uh, the process of trying out all of these systems uh, and seeing demos uh, helped clarify the needs of McLeod Lake and other related Daneza groups who share a similar um, uh, um, social structure and needs. Um, so they felt that they needed their own heritage preservation system with indigenous-centered systems to help them with heritage vitalization um, this is a five-year plan that uh, we're just starting to work on towards sustainable First Nations digital curation. And um, the idea is that you have a secure database, um, meaning encrypted, backed up, um, good infrastructure. <laughs> um, you have existing collections that you put into the database. You have potential uh, collections that you can put in. Um, the potential ones that, so the existing ones we knew about were tr existing TL TLUS data, oral histories, um, map data, secondary language materials that have been collected over um, 
decades. Um, existing GIS data, membership data also, so that with people you can, um, uh, the, the idea with the membership data is that it would potentially work into genealogies also. So whenever someone's name is mentioned, you can use it as a part of a search feature also, and then integrate it into genealogy database. Um, our eventually archival heritage data. Um, uh, community documents from the community. And so all of these would be fed in to the land and cultural resource management system um, with, and with an automated land referral tracking system that has the built-in report building. Um, that's the, this is the first piece we're working on. Sort of that plus starting to upload um, backlogs of traditional land use data um, that already exists in digital format. Um, monitoring programs is another big thing that they wanted to be able to manage, access, automate the processes for getting information out. They do a lot of collecting, but the, then they haven't been able to do anything with what they collect because it's not in a system anywhere. Um, and then with this whole process, um, we were the idea is this is a closed system, not an open system. And um, we'll build in uh, processes for defining, further defining and refining community defined rights to control and access the heritage materials. So very few people would have access at the beginning. Um, it would probably be the land referral manager, the people directly working with the materials. Um, I'll just say also McLeod Lake or Treaty 8, they joined Treaty 8 in, um, in I think it was two, year 2000. And um, so they chose that as opposed to going the treaty process, doing a, a um, signing a new treaty with the government. Um, they should have probably been on Treaty 8. They were just out hunting when the treaty commissioners came through. So um, really it sort of made sense for them to to be included in Treaty 8, and they felt it was the fastest way for them to, um, to start asserting their own, um, their own rights to their heritage materials. Um, so, uh, challenges. Biggest challenge, lack of core funding for indigenous groups infrastructure and staffing. So, so far we're funding it through development but you're funding it with, through development to try and preserve your lands, but if you get it funded by development, they wreck your lands. It's sort of a, it's a catch-22, right? Um, so if people have ideas about how to lobby for core funding to be for every First Nation, my, my perspective is every First Nation in Canada as part of their core funding from the government should have a heritage archive or information specialist that can help with this information. Um, then the other challenges, current limited capacity of band members to manage the CMS, but then of course opportunities for training and skill development like you're showing us today, everyone here is. Um, um, and um, the, one of the biggest ones, well, archives often trigger painful memories. Um, so knowing, being sensitive to that and knowing how to deal with that when it comes. And um, standardizations also for CMS software is another big issue. So um, in terms of... Uh, where we go from here, I think there's lots of opportunities with um, the government um, supporting the UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights with a recent um, Silkotain uh, William decision um, to lobby for some of these changes to, to infrastructure and funding to stop the slow violence that um, that is often incorporated into heritage management practices, whether, whether it's just sort of embedded <laughs> in some ways, in that funding goes to inst outside institutions usually. Not to, it's very hard for a First Nation to get funding themselves to do this type of work. 
So I'd like to thank everyone for their, um, for their time and for sharing everything, all their information today, and we'll be incorporating ideas from, from everyone as we go forward with this. Thank you, Amber. Our final panelist is Michael Wynn. Michael is a recent graduate from the iSchool at UBC. And while there, he worked next door as a student librarian at Waywa Library. And we'll have an opportunity to tour there just in a little bit. Um, he also helped with previous indigitization cohorts. So we had the pleasure of working with Michael when he was here. And he is now the digital applications librarian at Washington State University, where he primarily provides training and support for the Mukutu CMS. And some of you may have attended his workshop yesterday afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. Um, of course, thank you to all of our hosts, the Steering Committee for the Digitization Program, um, and the Musqueam lands that we're on. So I'm not going to go through a lot of the technical details that we covered in our workshop yesterday. If anybody would like to know more about those, certainly come talk to us later. Um, I will give a really brief background on Mukudu, um, and I want to talk about primarily about the com community engagement that we've had, both in the development of the software and in the work we're doing with new communities coming on board now. So if you're not familiar, Mukadu is an open source access tool. It's something that you would layer in addition to the rest of your digital preservation plan. Um, so it varies in, in other ways to some of the other CMSs that we've heard about today. So before Mukadu, uh, back in the start in 2002, the project director, Kim Christian Withy, um, was working in Central Australia in Tennant Creek. And within that community, there was a need to provide community members access to um, a specific series of photos. And what they wanted was a digital, uh, an offline digital platform that would replicate the existing face-to-face -face access protocols that they had within the community. Who can view what materials and, and for what reasons. Uh, after that, after the, the initial development of that, and Kim is still in contact with, uh, with the Warmungu community in Tennant Creek um, and continues to work with them, um, working at Washington State University, uh, the university has a memorandum of understanding with 11 plateau tribes. And in addition to that, there's a Native American advisory board to the president of the university. So in 2009, that advisory board made a request to the university, basically said, you and other local institutions have materials that belong to us traditionally or photos recording taken of us related to our lands and we would like to have access to them. So the request was for some kind of online access um, because there's tribal members both locally across states and across the world uh, had to be able to provide access to our, some of our library collections and there was a need to incorporate multiple voices and stories within the content. So not just the information that the university recorded or, or the other museums, but community knowledge as well. So as part of that development process, um, there were tri uh, tribal representatives visited the university and our partner institutions at the moment. There's WSU, the Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture in Spokane, National Anthropological Archives, and the National Museum of the American Indian. So we brought community members in to look at archivals, archival photos, documents, and other museum objects. And even though it's a digital platform, really the most important steps are about community activity and discussion. It's a technology, it's a tool, it's by no means a replacement for that face-to-face that -face or that interaction between, between individuals. So it always starts with community, with their materials, and grows from there. A few weeks ago, we launched the latest version of this tool. It's called the Plateau People's Web Portal. It's built on Mukudu CMS. Uh, it's a custom installation that we run at our university. Uh, it brings together materials of importance to six of the 11 Plateau tribes. Uh, we're open to collaboration with the others, but at the moment, six have come on board. And that would be the Yakima, Warm Springs, Umatilla, Colville, Spokane, and Coeur d'Alene. And one thing that I love about this is the background image is the Columbia River, and that was chosen by the tribal representatives uh, because it uni unites all of the plateau tribes in the region. So that's the bond that brings them together um, and carries them forward as well. This just quickly shows some of the categories that were built into the portal. Um, originally, there were nine categories for browsing. Um, 
Now there are 12. It was a multi-year process to make that change to add those additional categories. Um, the community discussion, the community engagement with the tribal representatives and other members, um, it's a lot of work. But again, that's something that's been very, very valuable from the start. And this is just an aggregation of some of the features that Mukudu now supports. So it supports a wide range of media formats, video, audio, images, documents, text, others. Um, so we have a video of some Warm Springs community members, images of their item. It supports some basic mapping information. It's not a full, full GIS service like some other uh, CMSs. Um, over on the bottom right, you can embed additional metadata, cultural narrative, traditional knowledge. Uh, again, they can be in a range of different formats. And a few snaps up on the right of the traditional knowledge labels, which are fully supported within Mukudu. Uh, and actually fully customizable within each Mukudu site. You can customize the text of the TK labels, which we've all talked about a little bit earlier. And, and really, the, the need is to provide rich, um, a place to build rich stories, rich narratives, and to include multiple layers of knowledge and multiple community voices. So looking a little bit about some current uses of Mukudu, uh, this was actually a planning site um, being worked, with, worked on with Musqueam here. Um, and it was, uh, it's a virtual exhibit of Musqueam public art found around the city of Vancouver. Uh, the goal is to educate the public about um, Musqueam art and knowledge and the connection to the city. One, uh, it was also built around highlighting artists, artist biographies, and building collections around their work. And one thing that to me, or one thing that really highlights the community engagement is initially there was no mapping feature. I mentioned that we have it now and it came about directly because of this project. There was a need, they worked on the development for it and we said, that seems like something that we've missed and would be of great use to other communities, and we rolled it into a later version of the software when we were able to develop it. So we're always looking for that community-level grassroots engagement to help us develop new features and work with it going forward. This is um, a screenshot from the Mira Canning Stock Route Project in Australia. Uh, it's a collection of over 40,000 items from uh, Aboriginal artists all, all along the Canning Stock Route. Uh, they narrate the colonial history of that part of the country, of that part of the continent. It contains artist interviews, videos, and um, includes uh, both English and local languages. And it's another uh, very public site intended to educate visitors and non-native uh, community members. This is the SIPNIC Digital Library for the Kirk Tribe in Northern California. Uh, it's primarily based around food security materials. I believe it's uh, largely funded by a large USDA um, Department of Agriculture grant. Uh, so this is a case of it being largely documents coming from scholars and government agencies. But on top of that, they're adding traditional knowledge, cultural narrative through audio interviews, videos. They're going out onto the lands, um, taking additional photos, making recordings. Um, and it's a collaborative effort between multiple uh, departments within the tribe. And one thing worth mentioning here is that uh, most of the content does require having a registered account. So this is not a public site. It is being used internally, which is a little bit different than the ones we've seen before. And this is a shot from the Aludic Museum in Kodiak up in Alaska. So this is primarily focused on language speakers and oral histories, uh, and very much a focus on linguistic revitalization. Most of the content is audio files. Most of it is, is um, publicly accessible, though some is restricted. They've uh, used as a platform to highlight current and, and past language speakers. Um, so they, it's a mix of biographies, current recordings, and then also historical collections held at the museum as well. So they've used a few of our collections-based features to build that out. Uh, this is a very quick shot of the Tohon site, also um, from California. And I wanted to mention this because they're one of the participants this year in the Tribal Stewardship Cohort Program that's going on at WSU. So it's a, it's a program, a IMLS grant funded program bringing together members from six tribes over the course of a year uh, to learn about cultural heritage management. So it's a range of hands-on training, policy planning, documents. It's kind of like in digitization scaled up. Um, we're taking it beyond the audio and doing all sorts of media digitization and just general institutional planning as well. Um, and the reason that Tohon has a site is each of the participating tribes, uh, we're hosting a site for them at the end of it for a couple of years, and then we'll be working with them to main maintain it after as well. Another site from the cohort is um, 
This is also from Kuruk, so the same tribe that had the Sipnik Digital Library. And this is um, a, a food, another food site. They're looking at uh, traditional and contemporary recipes and traditional foods information. So a little more uh, community generated than their other site, which is more institutionally focused. Recently, we've started working with uh, Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico. Um, in this particular case, we were uh, working in conjunction with the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress to bring back a series, a collection of photos and hopefully other materials um, going forward that have not been held in the community for a number of years. Uh, actually, have never been available to community members. So we brought digital and print copies of those materials um, into the Zuni Public Library. They invited community members to come in, interact with the materials, tell their stories about them. Um, we did audio recordings, digital transcription, and we also did some work with their bilingual, bilingual language education program um, to start recording um, entries for a dictionary, which is another feature that we have in beta testing, which will hopefully be available soon. And very quickly, lastly, um, we have more training going on with communities. My coworker, Lotus, and I back there are going to be visiting the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians in Michigan. They're another member of the Tribal Stewardship Cohort Program. And we're going to be looking at running mo uh, Mukudu Mobile workshops with both uh, children and elders at one of their summer camps this summer. So that's going to be a new project for us. Um, every time we work with, with a new community, a new tribe, a new nation, um, they teach us something new about the, the kinds of engagement we can have. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. We do have a few minutes left for questions, so if anybody has any, I can run around with the microphone. Anyone? Questions or even comments or anything you want to share about your experiences working with different software platforms? No? Well, I talked a little bit earlier about uh, my experience at the UBCIC, and I work at the Museum of Anthropology now, and a lot of people might think that, you know, we'd really have it together there with regard to how we're managing our own digital records and integrating the library and archives along with the museum um, object collection, but we have a lot of work to do in that area ourselves, and everything is very siloed, kind of like what Elizabeth was talking about at the beginning, you know, the, the archival software that we use um, is a fairly new system that was launched. Elizabeth McManus is who's in the room. She did a lot of work getting our installation of Atom together, which was an, ar an open source archival management system, and so, you know, it's working. It's pretty good. I mean, we've got at least um, all of our archival records described at the FON level. And, but it's totally separate from the library collection, which is in um, UBC library system of Voyager. And then the object catalog is, again, an entirely different software. So if you want to come to the museum and look up everything we have on any given subject or um, people, um, you're going to have to search at least three different things and probably talk to four or five different people to accomplish that. So we're looking at ways to try to better integrate that. You know, we um, are using a little mix of open source along with um, proprietary software, along with custom developed software, and really need to figure out something to tie it all together. So that choice whether to go from proprietary to open source is always a big decision. And, you know, we're kind of having the rug pulled out from under, under us with our digital asset management system right now by being forced into an upgrade, which might force us into a migration to a different system. So anyways, that's just my little personal experience. And I guess, you know, if anything is, you know, I'm leaning more and more towards building a custom system towards us. If money was not the object, that's definitely the route I would go. We have the RRN, which is amazing, and maybe that should be the platform for all of our library and archival materials if we can pump that information in there. But but then, you know, then, you know, everyone's going to have to log in. It's going to be a, like a user account kind of registration restriction. So there's a lot to figure out there. That's kind of my story. And I really appreciate the panel sharing all of their knowledge. I'm looking closely at collective access. I think that might be a, a good option. And a lot of people that ask me about these kinds of things, I make them take a look at that system. And Mukutu too, like I, I, I'm, I've looked at that when I was at the UBCIC. I was thinking that that might be a really good option moving forward with the digital collections there. But again, once you, once you have a collection built in something, like moving that to another 
platform is a huge deal. So, you know, I am very guilty of taking the path of least resistance and just, you know, working with what, what's already in place. So, anyways, thank you. Thank you, panelists. And we have a few gifts. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, just last call for questions or comments, uh, if there are any. Just don't want to make make sure that if people have them, they have the opportunity to. There's one. Yeah. Hang on. I'm interested in the uh, like the process of community consultation after so or maybe not so much the consultation but what are communities doing after everything's set up like do they have a, a, a like a plan or a process for evaluating I don't even call it the effectiveness or the use of it or what's actually taking place with it after it's been developed Um, so with regards to Mukudu and sort of the ongoing community development assessment, um, it depends how, how they implement it. So if it's, since it is open source, some people, there are installations that we know nothing about. Um, periodically I'll get an email and say, you know, we've been using it for however long and now we have a problem. I'm like, I, I've never heard of you, but that's great. And we'll figure it out. So. Um, I can only speak to the cases where we do get feedback, and when we do, it's, it's usually something that either we can help with or we will look at, at potentially helping to migrate if there's a different system that fits needs as well. There's no reason um, that you're locked into using it indefinitely, so if you are working with it for a number of years and you run into an issue, well, our goals have shifted or our collections have shifted, it's very easy to get the content out into, um, into a standard format and work with it somewhere else. Um, that or we do our best to accommodate and look at future development. Many, probably the vast majority of the features have come, uh, that are in Mukudu have come about directly because somebody has asked for it and said, we would like it to do this and it doesn't currently, um, and we will look at developing that uh, in conjunction with communities. For our collection, we um, actually consult with our survivor community. We have an advisory. We have teacher and student advisory that we beta with. We pilot things with. We're a bit, um, we love to pilot things on organization of small scale, figure out some of the issues, and then try it at a bigger scale. So we consider our first year and a few months once we launch it to be a beta year. And we have um, protocols and plans in place to collect data from educators, from researchers, from students, and continually work with our um, survivor advisory community and community to then put that feedback into our next iteration, which we figured this will be a bit buggy because we tried to do a lot of a lot of things um, in this one but once we roll it out probably you know it'll hopefully improve moving forward I'm sure our, our mistakes will come to light <laughs> but yeah so it's like we see an ongoing process very iterative um, but uh, that's kind of the exciting part too so. thank you oh one more I was just one more say, um, in terms of uh, getting community f feedback um, getting uh, as many people from the community to, to um, review what's in there and um, start using the archive, whether it's for, um, uh, we've done like small community ex exhibition projects like on uh, Dunny's on moose hunting, and then they can use the archive to start searching, um, searching for materials, and whether they're old or new, they can, they can find whatever they want. <laughs> um, that's one way to get people in. Then also um, ongoing language work and uh, transcription uh, work, getting uh, community members to work on that and pairing elders with y younger people, getting the younger people to do the typing and um, um, actually work with the elder, you know, maybe with one other person there doing the play, pause, stop, <laughs> you know, sort of. Um, so a three-person team, but really getting what's one thing we learned from the Dunny Wajich project with um, Doig River people 
was the youth weren't involved, they were involved in the documentation of, um, of materials, but they weren't involved in the, uh, the translation work. And uh, at the end of the project, I had one uh, youth say, we have dreamers? And I felt like we had failed, <laughs> you know, because we really hadn't, she had worked a little bit, she worked on the cataloging of the materials, so she was, who was there that day, you know, filling out all the little metadata fields, but she wasn't involved in the actual content. And um, it was the elders who were more, more of the elders came to the, we had extensive community reviews for, pub, for what we chose to share to the public. Um, so I, for, from my experience, like making community exhibits, but community-based exhibits that everyone's involved in can really help to get everyone involved in it. In, the, in, the, in what's in, finding what, what's in the archive and, and what issues there are with the materials and how they want to share them or not. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Much appreciated. It's another reminder of how important it is to have community-led programs and projects, and, and that's one of the key uh, foundations of, of this gathering and uh, also of the of the work that I do with the Ike Barber Learning Center. So once again, thanks so much. We're about to uh, take a break, but before we do, a couple of brief, uh, brief um, requests. One is a reminder to fill in the feedback uh, over on the poster boards. Uh, we really invite you to do so. Um, one of the main goals of this uh, event is to to hear to hear from you um, in any way we can, and this is just one avenue for doing that. Um, a little bit about logistics for you know, kind of pre dinner, pre and during dinner logistics. I'm, I've been advised to let you know that. Um, there's a cash bar, and our local artisans, I mentioned this early, at the dinner tonight, who may be o taking only cash in the form of payment. I, uh, um, so in terms of if you need an ATM, it's, um, they don't have an ATM at the Musqueam Cultural Center, um, so the opportunities for, for having, you know, accessing an ATM here on campus are over at the, uh, what's called the Nest or, or the Student Union Building um, on campus. And um, if you need to, if you need directions on about how to get there, um, just ask at the registration desk. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, the other thing I've been asked to talk about is weather tonight. Um, you know, there may be some impact on on the dinner by some unpleasant weather, so you know, make appropriate footwear choices um, before you get on the bus. So uh, during the break, we are very happy to have uh, to be offering, um, thanks to the staff at the Waywa Library, a tour of the Waywa Library, which is just a few short steps um, outside and to the east of where we currently are. The Waywa Library is, is really unique in Canada. It's the only uh, indigenous and aboriginal focused um, library at a post-secondary institution. Um, and so it's quite unique in that sense to be, to be you know, uh, that single example in Canada. So we invite you, if you have time, to go over and to tour the library and to chat with the the host there and have, have a look around. So with that, um, we will take a break and our next session will begin at 3.45. So um, please try and make your way back by that time. <laughs>